Okay, so uh, welcome back uh, to the to the second hour. Uh, so essentially, we just continue where we have stopped. Namely, um, we look here at the continuity and the um, momentum equations, which together form the Navier-Stokes equations for um, for incompressible flow. Now, before before again before we go back to uh, to solving actually quiet flow. Um, I would actually uh, discuss a little bit more um, one particular aspect, and that is the, the aspect of uh, one of the solution variables, and that's the pressure. So um, maybe we should just write that down. So the unknowns, oops, that's the wrong color. The unknowns um, in this particular case would be uh, the velocity ui. So that is essentially a vector of u, v, and w. And then, of course, we have uh, the pressure p. So that is a total of four unknowns in each point. And that is, um, that is uh, fair enough, because we actually have four equations. We have the continuity equation, which is one equation. And then we have the momentum equations, which is a vector equation. So we have three equations there. And one plus four obviously is four. Uh, one plus three is uh, four. But now my my next question, which I think is very important to understand, is actually um, uh, one one problem. If you want to formulate it like that, one problem here is actually well we have. We have the three velocity components, u, v, and w, and I guess that's that's perfectly fine because we have evolution equations for these uh, three velocity uh, velocity components. We have here um, a term dy dt, and that's of course the time evolution of u, v, and w. But there seems to be no problem when it comes to uh, the velocity component. But the problem really is, how would we calculate the pressure p in this? Um, in this uh, situation. Well, it turns out we don't actually have an equation for P. The pressure just appears in the momentum equation, but there is no explicit um, equation in uh, for, for the pressure P. Just the wrong pen. So no explicit um, equation for the pressure uh, P. And in addition to that, we also have the continuity equation, which is a scalar equation. Um, but this scalar equation actually doesn't have a time derivative. So it's not that we can just calculate the change in time based for the continuity equation. So we have no time, um, time derivative um, for the continuity equation. And of course, that's a that's a slight um, a slight issue um, because the pressure has a very specific role for incompressible flows. Before I um, before we now go further, I would actually like to start with a, a, a quick discussion or a quick poll. And there is this way of uh, posing your questions during the lecture. Let's see whether this actually works. I tried it yesterday. Um, I think I can do like this. Can you now see uh, the question popping up? I hope you can. So I would like to ask you um, a question here, which is then of course uh, um, related to the discussion now. What is the Mach number of an incompressible flow? I mean, now we derived the equations for, for, um, for incompressible flow. But what I would like to know uh, is, is the Mach number. The Mach number, as you all know, is the definition is defined as the speed divided by the speed of sound, the, the, the fluid speed divided by the speed of sound. So Mach, Mach 1 obviously means that you, that you travel with the speed of sound. So what is the Mach number for incompressible flow? Can you answer that? Is it large? Is it infinity even? Is it small? Or is it even zero? For any type of you know, flow speed that you have. So I have now 10 people that have answered or 11. 
Okay. I guess a, a certain pattern is um, is showing up. Um, now, uh, actually, I don't know how to stop it. Uh, I think I can just close this. Okay, so it seems that um, most of you, 78% say that the Mach number for incompressible flow is actually low for a, a small number, which is correct. But actually, the more correct correct answer is that it's exactly zero. So the Mach number that we would consider for for incompressible flow is actually zero, which means it's a good approximation for any type of um, um, of, of low Mach number flow, so low speed flows. But if you use, if you decide to use the 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 incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, you're actually solving a flow at um, at, um, at zero Mach number, which translates to the fact that the speed of sound, so the C in, in, in the definition of Mach number, is actually infinity because only then the Mach number is always um, zero. That's maybe, <clears throat> maybe an important point here because actually it explains something. Um, the speed of sound, wait. speed of sound, in incompressible flow, incompressible flow is infinity. So it's a, any pressure waves, you know, acoustics, acoustic waves, they would actually propagate at infinite speeds. And of course, now I essentially already said it, this means that the pressure in incompressible flow the pressure um, in incompressible flow adjusts adjusts um, instantaneously. And of course, that now now I guess you you start to understand a little bit why why I also noted the pressure as a problem for incompressible flow, um, but it also explains why this is actually the case. Since you, you have a speed of sound which is infinite, it also means that any pressure pulse will directly be felt in the whole domain. And of course, that makes it clear why there is no time derivative. Because a time derivative for the pressure would actually mean that there is a certain speed, a certain you know, convection speed associated to the pressure. But this is not the case. It, it's, it's just infinite. And of course, that's exactly the, the problem or the well, that's the problem of, of, of incompressible flows, that pressure waves, pressure waves um, travel at infinite speeds. Travel at infinite speeds or speed. And essentially, as I, as I just wrote here, the Mach number um, being U divided by C is zero. And of course, this has, large consequences for <clears throat> um, for how one would actually uh, treat an incompressible flow. Just think of, um, of a very simple example. We have a very long pipe here. Think of the Ciclope pipe, if you wish. So this is a, this is a pipe here. And I come with a hammer. So I have a hammer here. Um, let me draw a hammer here, so like this. Maybe I write what it is. So it's a, this is a pipe, a pipe filled with a fluid, and I have a hammer, and I hammer on, 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 on this pipe from, from this side so that I create a pressure pulse inside the pipe. And of course, now the, the typical answer, if I would ask you how long it takes uh, until this, um, this hammering would have been felt on the other side, is well, it travels with the speed of sound. But now, of course, the speed of sound is infinite, which means that I would feel instantaneously at the other side that I have hammered on the, on the left side. And of course, that's independent of how long the pipe is, just because this pressure pulse is traveling at infinite speeds. And of course, now you, I guess, directly uh, see that there is both a mathematical, but also a numerical consequence of this. The mathematical consequence is that the the, 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 
Was there a question or? Uh, I think somebody is not muted. Okay, thanks. Um, so the consequence of, of um, what I was just saying is <coughs> that the, so the numeric the, 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 the mathematical consequence is that the type of the equation actually changes from hyperbolic to a uh, parabolic problem. So it's the, the it's it's actually parabolic or elliptic in the in the pressure, um, and from a numerical point of view or to, kind of from a solution point of view, it means that the pressure um, in the context of the Navier-Stokes equation uh, plays the role of a kind of a Lagrangian multiplier, which which tries to enforce the constraint of the continuity equation at all times instantaneously. So it means that. In order to, to solve this dilemma with hammering on one side and feeling it on the other side, that this is instantaneous, it means that essentially all the points in the whole pipe need to talk to each other uh, when, when you solve just for, for one time instance. Numerically, of course, that means that you need to have um, you know, grid points that, that communicate with each other. Mathematically, it means, as I was just saying, that the type actually goes to an elliptic or a parabolic uh, type, which means that that you, you need to actually solve for everything um, at once. You cannot just you know, start on one side and march through the domain. And of course, this is a, this is a very important aspect to consider um, when talking about incompressible uh, flow. Okay, <clears throat> but um, now finally, we can go back to our QED flow that we, that we actually started out with uh, trying to solve. Um, so let's go back to to quet flow. Well, so um, just keep or just remember, quet flow was this, uh, this situation here. We have two walls that move um, in opposite directions and we wanted to find the, the exact solution of, of that in some way. Yeah, so in order to do that, we of course need to do some, some assumptions and uh, let me just list them. So we have some assumptions. So, well, first of all, we say we are only um, interested in, in a steady case, which means that the time derivatives should be zero. DDT is zero. We want to look at a very large domain. So that means we look at infinite plates. So our two plates, they're infinitely big. They have a distance of H or a capital H, but apart from that, they're infinitely large. And that actually has uh, two different consequences, um, which are kind of, this, which are roughly the same. Well, the two consequences is that we have something that's called parallel flow. So all the flow is actually only in the in a plane, plane parallel direction. Or we can also say that the flow is fully developed. So there is no, spatial change of the flow from one position to another position. Of course, that's a direct consequence of assuming that the plates are infinitely large, because that means no, no point is actually different than any other point. So therefore, um, yeah, the flow is fully developed. The consequence of that is that d dx, so spatial or x derivatives are zero. The, the third important assumption is that we're actually looking at a two-dimensional geometry. Actually, perhaps this I should have mentioned before the infinite plates. Um, but two-dimensional geometry essentially means that, that it's sufficient um, to only look at the motion of the plates in one direction uh, without loss of uh, generality. I can assume that this is the x direction. That would then in consequence mean that all the spanwise derivatives, ddz are zero. And of course, also I can assume that the w component, so the velocity component in that spanwise direction are zero. So that's a consequence of two dimensionality. Okay, so that these are my assumptions. Then I also define my boundary conditions. Well, I, I talk about a, um, 
I talk about uh, partial differential equation. And of course, as you all know, if you have partial differential equations, we need to specify some boundary conditions. And in this particular case, if you remember again, we had these two, these two plates like this, where we had the velocity perhaps going in, in this direction and in this direction with the velocity uw, oops, like this. Well, that kind of uh, tells me also what, also what these, uh, these boundary conditions are. Well, we have the velocity to be the wall velocity. I'm writing this as a vector, um, uw at the two solid walls. <clears throat> And um, this, this wall velocity, of course, is a, is a vector. So we can say that the, the velocity vector uv at one of the walls would be the vector of uw comma zero. Now, as I need to again introduce the coordinate system so that, that it's clear. So the x component would be uh, the wall value and the y component you know, through the wall would be, um, would be zero. So these would be the boundary conditions. Also here, I would like to spend a few, uh, a few more comments on, on just making the no notation clear. So first of all, if we have boundary conditions that look like this, so when we, when we set the, the, the velocity value to a specific um, number or, or function, then we talk about Dirichlet um, boundary conditions. Conditions. Now I didn't actually. Um, I didn't. I didn't look up the the years when Dirichlet um, was was actually living. I, I assume it was sometimes in the 18th or 19th uh, centuries or the 1800s. Um, so these are Dirichlet conditions. There's also something that is called uh, Neumann boundary conditions. These are um, boundary conditions on derivatives. And there is also the third the third type, which is Robin. The Robin conditions, which are a combination of Dirichlet and Neumann conditions. Um, when it comes to Dirichlet conditions, so in this case, the U, UW, um, that essentially means that the fluid right at the wall has the same speed as the, as the wall. And that is what is typically, typically called the no slip boundary condition. Now in this case, because the wall is moving, um, UW is actually not zero, but, um, but typically would say, you know, slip condition would just mean that the velocity is zero in the case of a, of a still standing wall. The zero here, so that's the V component um, through the wall. Um, it says that my internet connection is bad. I don't know, is this the case? Okay, I don't know, maybe the internet connection is better now. Um, so the V component uh, being zero here, that is actually not part of the, uh, the no slip boundary condition, but this is something that is called the no penetration or no permeability condition. So that means nothing can actually go through the wall. It can only move um, in the same direction as the ball, so in a wall parallel direction. Okay. Um, now, let me just uh, say one more comment on these no slip boundary conditions, um, as I was uh, just mentioning. And what we, what essentially what we're saying is that if you have a, a wall here, something like that, our velocity profile will always kind of look like this. This is a velocity profile developing on, on this wall. And um, at this point here, you would essentially uh, assume that, that we have um, uh, no slip boundary conditions. The velocity would be, would be zero in case of a still standing wall. But of course, now um, the thing is that if you, if you would zoom in here, kind of do a blow up of, of this region, of course, if you then zoom in, um, uh, sufficiently much, then actually your 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 surface maybe looks like this. It's not at all just a, a smooth wall. There is some sort of roughness 
um, at least at, at, at some level, um, available uh, or, or present. And of course, that also means that behind each of these little little rough uh, these these little hills, you would maybe have a region of a of a little bit of of well, uh, of a little bit of, of flow separation, perhaps. And and it's clear that this is not uh, a no slip condition in the sense that the velocity is just um, uh, just zero. But now um, the assumption is that this height over which uh, the the roughness actually plays a role is actually very limited, and we can we can consider it to he, to be here on the size of epsilon. If I just write a few comments here. Uh, this thin the thin region, thin region which is dominated by roughness. Um, and in um, <clears throat> and in this region, essentially the um, the boundary condition that's then really a, a boundary condition based on the local uh, chemistry. Um, so we can essentially say that there we have um, local adhesive forces that act between the solid and the and the fluid, and it's really dominated by by the, com the chemistry between the, um, the, the two species. Now, of course, you can, you can wonder um, how big this is. And typically this epsilon, so this, this size, is on the order of 10 to maybe 100 nanometers um, thickness. And of course, that means if you now talk about, um, if you talk about um, objects that, that we typically use within engineering, so, for instance, um, for a car, um, let's assume that a car has, you know, dimensions of, of one meter, uh, for instance, then this epsilon can really be assumed or can be, uh, can be assumed um, zero. So that means that the region over which the no-slip condition is kind of, you know, uh, th these mountains is very, very small. But of course, for other areas, so for instance, nanofluidics, so the fluid dynamics of very small, um, small channels, for instance, um, so bio, bioengineering, for instance, or Another uh, important um, buzzword these days: lab on chips, for instance. So when you when you do a kind of a whole, you know, uh, an analysis lab on the size of of, uh, of chips, um, these differences of where exactly or how exactly the, the no slip boundary condition is enforced is actually quite um, relevant. So these differences. may be relevant, but not for cars, not for cars, not for airplanes, and certainly not for, for our cores. But, and that's, that's also why I would like to mention this uh, um, in a little bit more detail, um, there may be situations that we actually have um, surface roughness. So this roughness in a, in a much, uh, for much larger, uh, or in much larger geometries. I mean, think of sandpaper, for instance, or just you know surfaces that are of very bad quality. And um, one typical example would be uh, the surfaces of ship ships, so ship hulls, for instance. Where you know, if you think of it, you have a ship hull, and then you have algae and mussels and uh, what, whatever growing on. On, on, on your surfaces. And of course, these, these surfaces are then macroscopic also with relation to um, the flow structures. And then of course, the surface roughness needs to be taken into account and your boundary condition is not simply no slip anymore. Uh, but this is the surface roughness. This is then mainly a problem for, um, 
when you then have turbulence, because all these hills, you know, this roughness will then also introduce disturbances into the flow, which then may actually grow, become unstable, and lead to a, um, a fully turbulent flow. So I guess Ramis will talk a little bit about um, about these types of, uh, of, um, of, of rough walls. But for us, um, that was the main point why I was also mentioning that. Um, for us, the main aspect is we can use no slip conditions um, and no penetration uh, or no permeability conditions um, as at, at boundaries which essentially means the fluid velocity is the same as the wall velocity. Okay, so now let's go back again to the, to the quet flow. So let's go back to the equations again. Um, yeah, so, so we, ha we, we had a, a number of assumptions and uh, let's just start with the continuity equation, which was dy dxi being zero. That's not the first equation that we that we look at. Okay, so we said that the flow is fully developed, or well, let, let's let's write it out first. A dy dxi being zero means du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz. Okay. Now, as um, kind of the typical uh, procedure when looking at exact solutions of Navier-Stokes, we need to go in and essentially neglect those terms where we have a good reason for neglecting them. In this case, we can actually neglect this term, the first one, du dx, and this we do because this is a parallel flow. Keep in mind, parallel was uh, written here that meant that du dx is zero. Then this one we can also neglect, dw dz, because we said it's a two-dimensional flow. Also this we set somewhere up here. Well, all the derivatives in z and also w is actually zero. So that means that of the whole continuity equation, what remains um, is simply uh, dv dy being being zero, and of course this is a you know it's a it's a, uh, a differential equation, but actually we can solve it um, because it just means that that v as a function of y, uh, the derivative of v as a function of y with respect to y is zero. So this we can integrate, and if we integrate this once, um, it means that v is simply a constant. Now we can even determine that constant and we can do that with our boundary conditions that we have um, introduced here, where we said that, that V at the wall is actually zero. So that means um, we, we can directly say, okay, this constant here means that V needs to be zero everywhere. That's just a, con uh, a consequence of the continuity equation. And we have already now solved one part of the, of the equations. V is zero. Okay, so that was the first, the first part. Then let's continue. Um, well, we have used the continuity equation. The next equation that one typically uses, maybe I should have actually written that, I can still do that. So, we write continuity. So the next equation that we that we typically use is the y momentum equation. So the vertical momentum equation. And also there, I start with writing out the full equation, and then we take out uh, our green pencil and we neglect terms. But let me write it out. So this is uh, dv dt plus u times dv dx plus v times dv dy um, plus w dv dz. And that should be minus one over rho dp dy <coughs> plus 
nu times na plus squared v. Okay, so uh, what terms remain here? Well, if I again start with the simple ones, let's take a one, take away this one here because this is 2D, so W is zero. Then this one can go away because we have a derivative in X, um, which we say that this is a parallel flow. This one goes away. Then we have this term that goes away because V is zero. We have just calculated before that V is zero everywhere. So that means we can take that one away. The same way this one goes away because again, V is zero. Then we have the first term here that also goes away because we said we wanted to look for steady solutions. Again, this was actually one of the assumptions that we made um, here in the beginning. We said that DDT is actually zero. Okay, well, there's not much left. It's just one term left. And this term means dp dy is um, zero. Well, what does that mean? Um, well, formally it means that p, the pressure, is actually um, is just a function of x. But that's that's what I can find out from here. So p is p of x. Of course, at this point, you could wonder why do I allow the pressure to be dependent on X, even though I said that uh, fully developed means that the flow is independent of X. And of course, that's a that's a very good question. Um, and the answer will come later, but I can already give now a first indication. Um, the issue is that in the Navier-Stokes equations, we only have the pressure gradient um, uh, going uh, or we have the pressure gradient um, going in, not the actual uh, uh, pressure. <coughs> um, so that means that if we had now, for instance, a, a, a pressure gradient here, it would actually translate to a forcing, or a, you know, if it's if it's linear, it would be a constant force in the Navier-Stokes equation. And in particular for channel flow, um, as we will see later on, we could actually assume that there may be such a force, maybe coming from an external pressure gradient, a pump that, that drives the flow. So that means fully developed does not mean that the pressure um, needs to be um, independent of X. It may mean it, but it's not um, required. So I, I just put this maybe as a kind of a, a question mark here. Why P of X, even if the flow is fully developed. I think there's not two P here. Deve de developed. So, so why, why is this? Okay, but anyway, we have now P as a, as a function of X. Much more we cannot do with the, the Y momentum equation. That means the next step would be, okay, we need to look at the X momentum equation. Well, also there, I would like to start with just writing down uh, the equation. So we have um, du dt plus u du dx plus v du dy plus w u d z, and that is minus one over rho d p d x plus nu times nabla squared u. And again, I take my, my green pen and I'm, I'm taking away now uh, various, uh, various terms. So this one, because it's 2D, <clears throat> this one, because V is zero, this one because it's um, uh, fully developed, and this one because it's steady. steady. What I'm keeping, however, 
um, are, or the terms that you need to keep are the, the two terms on the left hand side, on the, on the right hand side. And of course, that's also quite interesting. These are two force terms. All the acceleration is, is gone. So it's just two force, force terms, which means somehow there needs to be a balance between, well, the pressure force and the um, kind of the viscous force. <clears throat> so if I write, uh, write it down now, I get one over rho dp dx um, is nu, oops, nu times uh, nobla squared u. And this nu times nobla squared u is essentially, if I write it out, d squared u dx squared plus d squared u dy squared. And now again, the green pen comes out. This one goes again because it's fully developed. Um, so what we have left is just uh, the second derivative of u with respect to y. Okay, but now we actually need to talk about this, this, this pressure term, um, <coughs> which we have here. And I was mentioning before, for pipes, I was mentioning that maybe this could be an external forcing, a pump that is driving the flow. But in Kuwait, we actually don't have a pump. So the only force that is, that is kind of driving my flow is that we have these two walls that move with respect to each other. So that actually means for Kuwait, which we're interested right now. So for Kuwait flow, it actually turns out that this dp dx is actually zero. We cannot say what value the pressure has. It's also not relevant. But what we can say for Kuwait is that there's no difference in pressure between one point or another point. So that would really be in the classical sense of fully developed. Even the pressure is the, is the same everywhere. So P is constant. And if this is the case, then of course this term goes away. So what we have left with, or what we are left with is uh, essentially the simple equation du squared, d squared u dy squared is zero. So the second derivative of a function of y is zero. And of course, you all know what the solution to that is. Well, u is then a, a linear function, a times y plus, plus b. So this is, this is now the solution for, for quet. With two constants, a and b, which yet need to be decided, and then they are being decided based on the boundary conditions, of course. So let's note, let's write down a few um, observations that we have done so far. Well, one observation was exactly what I mentioned before. The, the fluid particles, they experience or they, they have no acceleration. No acceleration means, well, as I was saying before, all the terms on the on the right on the left side of the Navier Stokes equations, they have actually disappeared. <clears throat> so what we have is um, we have a, um, we have a, a balance between well the pressure we have now also said is gone. So essentially we just have a, a, a viscous balance between the boundary values. Excuse so me. Visc yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Can you please repeat uh, why the, um, the PDX is equal to zero in uh, for correct flow? Um, well, the, the, the reason for that is that in quet flow, um, we will not, we actually do not have an external way of imposing a pressure uh, gradient. In pipes, pipes and channels, as we will see later on, we actually, we can, <coughs> we can assume that we have a pump that is actually driving the flow um, through, through this pipe. Because there we need it because the walls are, are still. In quet flow, the flow is driven by the motion of the wall. And that is actually something that is called, we will, we will talk about that later again when we, when we go to pipes and channels. Um, we will call this to be shear driven. So the flow is driven by the shear that I impose from the motion of the wall. 
Um, in pipes and channels, it, has, it, it is actually pressure driven. That's why I need to have a pressure gradient there. So there's a, there's a fundamental difference between shear driven and pressure driven flows. In shear driven flows, we do not need to have an external pressure gradient. But this actually is not something that you can, that, that you see from the equations. That's the important point. That's why I was also, that's why I was also keeping the pressure here because there's no way of just saying from dp dy that p is constant or zero or something. The only thing that we can say from dp dy being zero is that p is a function of x only. It is our physical knowledge afterwards that we know that the flow is driven from the shear and not from the pressure. Therefore, we can set the pressure gradient to zero. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. But um, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very relevant question. It's important to understand um, this, this difference. But anyway, what I want to say is that now that we have this, that the pressure is zero, we can actually say that this is a viscous balance that we have inside, the, inside our domain. And the viscous balance is essentially depending on the choices of A and B. And this is de uh, determined by uh, the boundary conditions. So we can say it's a viscous balance between the boundary values. Okay, and then the, the third observation that is also very important, um, we actually have seen that V is zero, right? The vertical velocity is zero from uh, the continuity equation. And of course that means directly that the flow is only moving in the, um, in the, in the X direction. So it has only a U component. And of course that means that there is no, let's say circular motion. With a circular motion, I mean now, um, if I just make a sketch here. Um, so we know that the, the flow is only going in this direction. There's no vertical component. And of course that means that, you know, the flow is not kind of doing something like this. This is not going to happen because there's no V such. And, and of course, if there is no circular motion, the flow is then entirely parallel to the wall. And, um, and of course that means that this is really a, a laminar flow um, in the classical sense. It's really like sheets of, of flow as it's moving. Okay. We're still not fully done because we have actually not calculated A and B, uh, our, our two uh, case, uh, our, our two constants. And for that, we actually need to go back to um, to to our um, to where we started with, where we where we actually had two different cases. We had uh, case one and case two, where we had specific boundary conditions for uh, you know UV and so minus UV and plus UV or zero and two. Um, UW. Uh, so we need to uh, now really take these boundary conditions and 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 calculate A and B. And we do that now for case case one first. Um, and the boundary conditions were, you know, U at plus minus H. If I put the the, the, the origin of the coordinate system in the center, um, this was plus minus UW. Of course, with this, um, you can now go into uh, into this equation, and uh, it's very easy uh, to see that a would then be u w divided by h, and b actually becomes zero. With this, you would fulfill the boundary condition. That means now that our u as a function of y would be u w divided by h times y. This is now the solution that we have. And of course, now we have um, fully determined the, the solution in our three variables for quet flow. We have, well, we have V being zero. Um, well, maybe we should actually say that this is the solution for P. P is constant. And we have now also found that U of Y is UW divided by h times y. Of course, now we can actually sketch it. So 
these are my two walls. Um, this is kind of the zero line. I have my coordinate system that started in the middle. This is X, this is, this is Y. And um, well, if I'm now plotting in green my, my velocity field, it would essentially look like this, like, oops, sorry. Okay, whatever. Um, it would look like this. I have a straight, a straight line. Here it will go backwards, and here it will go forward. And of course, my boundary condition was exactly uw here, positive, and uw in this direction. So this is now my solution for um, uh, for for quet flow. And I think that's an excellent uh, time now to, to take yet another break. Um, I will stop the recording. Um,